So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to be talking about the case of Stephen Lawrence. So quickly before I get into this video I just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This is all just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. So Stephen Lawrence was an 18 year old boy born on September 13th 1974 in South East London. He was the first child of Jamaican born parents Neville and Don Maureen Lawrence. Stephen eventually became the oldest of three siblings when two years after Stephen was born they had his younger brother Stuart and then when Stephen was eight years old they had his younger sister Georgina. Stephen was very determined and headstrong and stubborn but not always in a negative way he just kind of knew what he wanted and he was gonna go out and get it. He was very creative, he was a very talented artist, he could draw really well but above all else, Stephen was very athletic and he excelled in running. He took part in marathons and so many kind of athletics competitions, all of which he did really well in. He studied technology, physics, English language and English literature at college and hoped to one day become an architect. On Thursday, April 22nd, 1993, 18-year-old Stephen Lawrence had his usual day at school when after school he decided to go into Lewisham with his friend Dwayne Brooks and they were just going to kind of look around the shops. After about an hour in town the boys got the bus back to Stephen's uncle's house where they played video games for a while. Before long it was coming up on 10 o'clock and Stephen's mum always wanted him home by 10.30 and so the boys realised it was getting late and so they rushed to the bus stop. The bus that the boys would have normally got from this stop wasn't actually due until 10.30 and obviously that was going to get them home way too late and so the boys began formulating another route that they could take home. Instead of getting the usual one bus all the way home the boys were going to get a few shorter bus routes that would hopefully get them home within the half an hour. So the boys took two shorter buses with no problems when they arrived at Elton to finally take the last bit of the journey from Elton to Lewisham where Stephen lived. They arrived at Elton at 10.25 so Stephen had five minutes to get home and he knew he wasn't going to do it but well, this bus that they were supposed to be getting from Elton to Lewisham seemed to be running a little bit late. Still at 10.35, so at this point Stephen was already five minutes late and the bus still wasn't there. So Stephen was getting really anxious that his parents were going to be mad at him or that they were going to be worried. So Stephen left Wayne at the bus stop and walked to the end of the road to a little junction bit to see if he could see a bus coming their way at all. He was only there for a few seconds just to check if a bus was coming and then he turned round and set back off to Dwayne. He was around halfway of the distance between where he'd gone to check for the bus and the bus stop where Dwayne was when he heard shouting. So Stephen looked across the road where he saw five or six white boys running towards him shouting racist slurs at him. Within seconds the group had swarmed Stephen and Dwayne, still at the bus stop, watched one of them lift a knife over the top of their head and plunge it down into Stephen's shoulder. And Dwayne was just kind of stood there in shock as he watched them do it again. They lifted the knife up again and stabbed into Stephen's body on the other side, this time by his collarbone. Both of the wounds were so severe that they actually punctured five inches or 13 centimeters into Stephen. They also punctured one of his lungs and cut open two of his main arteries. He will have been losing blood so quickly at this rate that scientists say that he would have lost all feeling in his right arm and he would have been having a lot of trouble breathing. At this point Dwayne realised that he was also in danger. This was an obvious racist attack. They ran over to his friend shouting racist slurs and then stabbed him twice and so Dwayne began running and shouted to Stephen to run with him too. And Stephen's attackers actually ran off straight after the second stabbing. The whole attack must have only lasted around 10 seconds. And even with a punctured lung, severed arteries and constricted breathing, Stephen began running. He actually ran 120 metres before collapsing to the ground and began bleeding out. So Dwayne ran to a nearby phone box and called for an ambulance. A few minutes later, a police car arrived at the scene. A police car, not an ambulance, a policeman. Dwayne had called the emergency services, asked for an ambulance because his friend was bleeding at an alarming rate and they sent a policeman instead. Obviously Dwayne was very angry and so the police that came actually sent off for an ambulance themselves but meanwhile they didn't seem to be too bothered with Stephen at all. Police were actually more concerned with accusing Dwayne Brooks, Stephen's best friend who had been there the whole time, told them the whole story from start to end 
but they still somehow believed it was him. They were accusing him of maybe having an argument with Stephen and so he'd done this to him or maybe the two boys were part of a gang and this was gang related. Police seemed to want to believe anything other than what Dwayne was telling them. Meanwhile, an 18 year old boy is bleeding to death on the road and they don't seem to care at all. Even if police thought that Stephen was already dead, he could have still been just unconscious. And so they should have been doing some form of first aid on him until the paramedics got there, but they weren't. Dwayne was practically begging the police to give Stephen some form of first aid, at least just check his pulse or his breathing or anything, but they literally just didn't touch him. In fact, because police didn't touch him or even look at him for too long, they didn't know the source of the bleeding. They actually believed that Stephen was bleeding from an injury in his head, not two stab wounds to the chest. And even though Dwayne was telling them the story of what had happened, Dwayne was telling them that he saw these people stab his friend twice in the chest, they weren't believing him. They believed that he had a wound to the head, but they didn't even check it. These officers at the scene were later on questioned about their ability and their willingness to give first aid at the scene, and it was found that these officers weren't even trained in first aid. In a basic UK first aid course, one of the first things you learn is the acronym ABC, meaning airways, breathing and circulation. And that is the first thing that you check, someone's airways, their breathing and their circulation. In fact, years later when this investigation into the police officers was going on, they were asked what ABC meant and none of them could even name one of the letters, never mind the whole thing. Anyway, as Dwayne and the police officers were waiting at the scene with Stephen for an ambulance to come, two people passed by, two Christians named Connor and Louise Taff. They saw that no one was really paying any attention to this boy bleeding out on the floor, and so they stepped in and gave this boy some attention. They didn't know first aid or anything, they didn't know how to physically help this boy, but they just kind of knelt by him, they held his hands, they spoke to him and they soothed him, they prayed for him. Connor prayed for the boy and his family while Louise held his hand and told him in his final moments that he was loved and that people cared for him. Finally, an ambulance arrived, took Stephen to the hospital where he was finally pronounced dead. However, it's believed that he died within minutes of collapsing to the floor. So within the hour, Stephen's family were informed of his murder and so they went to the hospital to go and see him. Stephen's mother, Doreen, said that he looked peaceful, almost as if he was smiling a little bit, like he was just asleep. She expected him to look scared or sad or angry just due to the way that he was killed, but he didn't look any of those things. She explained it as if maybe Stephen didn't know or expect that he was gonna die of his wounds. He just looked so peaceful that that thought couldn't possibly have been on his mind in his last moments. So right away, Stephen's murder investigation began and one officer was appointed the lead investigator. Even though this officer knew that he probably couldn't handle this case. This officer that was appointed lead investigator already had a lot on his plate. He had a lot of different cases to be dealing with and instead of just passing it on to someone else and saying, no, look, I don't have time for this, he took it on anyway. It was extra work and extra pay. He knew that he couldn't do it, but he took it on anyway and he knew he was probably going to have to pass it on to someone else and he did. After just a couple of days, it had to be passed on to another officer. And this meant that the case pretty much had to be started right over again. So those first two or three days were a complete write-off, where they could have got so much done right in the beginning, because now this new lead investigator had to be caught up on everything that was going on. He had to be told every single little detail of this case, which took another few days to do. And so at this point, they'd lost maybe five or six days when they could have been tracking down some murderers. That is a huge amount of time to just go missing in a murder case. So there were three people that actually witnessed Stephen's murder. Obviously Dwayne Brooks, his friend, and then two other people that were stood at the bus stop. All three of them were able to give witness statements and that ruled Dwayne Brooks out as a suspect completely but none of them could actually identify the real attackers. But in the days following the murder, several members of the public came forward with possible names of suspects, including a gang. Some people were calling in to police to give these names over, but other people were also trying to do it anonymously. So one person left a note on a police car, 
One person left a note in a phone box and then rang police and told them to check that phone box. So it was clear that a lot of people kind of feared for their own safety giving in these names. So they were obviously dangerous people. Within days of the murder, five suspects were identified. A gang of young boys from Eltham. The lead member of the gang was 17 year old Neil Acourt, who was the older brother of another gang member inside that gang, 16 year old Jamie Acourt. And then there was 17 year old Gary Dobbs who was kind of believed to have been like the brains of the gang and although he wasn't a leader he was actually more of a follower in this gang he was still the most kind of logical one. There was 16 year old Luke Knight and also 16 year old David Norris. David Norris was actually the son of a notorious gangster and drug dealer in that area as well. The gang were known to have a fascination with knives. They would always carry them and sometimes use them in fights. And the boys had been involved in racially motivated attacks before, one of which was only a few weeks before Stephen's murder. Just four weeks before Stephen's murder, Gary Dobson and Neil Acourt attacked a young black teenager called Kevin London and attempted to stab him. Around the same time, Neil, Jamie, David and Gary were all accused of stabbing two victims named Gurdeep and Stacey. And a year earlier, Neil's younger brother Jamie stabbed a black teenager named Darren Witham. So the gang have been involved in a lot of knife crime, a lot of racially motivated crime as well. Like I said, these five suspects have been put forward by a lot of people and looking at their criminal history, it looks likely that it could be them, but they still weren't arrested. There was grounds for reasonable suspicion at this point. I understand that there was no evidence, but there was grounds for reasonable suspicion and those boys should have been arrested, but they weren't. And police did nothing really. They didn't put them on surveillance, they didn't question them at all, they didn't do much of anything. But they did put a photographer outside an abandoned house that the boys used to use as a kind of gang base type thing. They put a photographer outside there, not a policeman, a photographer to take pictures of the boys entering and leaving the building to see if they were doing anything suspicious. And they did do something suspicious that the photographer caught. So Jamie Acourt, the younger of the Acourt brothers, was seen taking out a bin bag full of whatever, believed to have been evidence. He took it from this abandoned house into his car and drove away with it. But obviously because this photographer, it was the 1990s, he didn't have a phone, he had no way to contact police, all he could do was take pictures of it. Had that been a policeman there instead of a photographer, had a policeman been watching these boys, like police surveillance, he could have followed them and seen what was in that bin bag. But by the time the photographer had told police what he'd seen, it had been too late. There'd be no way to find where the boys took that bin bag. They would have probably burned it or something like that. So that's just another thing that the police did wrong in this case. And the police work in this case is just going to continue to get more and more frustrating. That's just a warning. Just a side note on how bad the police work was in this case. Years later, after this case was solved and everything, they had a kind of internal review on how the police handled this case. And it was found that a woman that could have been a vital witness, could have been there to witness Stephen's murder, tried getting in contact with police three times in the days following the murder. All of her calls were missed or ignored. And so on each of these three calls that she attempted, she also left a voicemail saying, please, can you get back in contact with me? But police never did. And I understand that they were busy, but that is one of the biggest parts of the investigation, answering calls, taking leads and things like that. And you can't tell me that they don't listen to voicemails. I understand them maybe missing the calls, but there's no excuse for them not getting back to her when they have time. And it'd be different if they just did that for one or two calls, like they accidentally miss one or two calls, accidentally miss one or two voicemails, but to miss three calls and three voicemails from the same woman, that just shows how much information they could have possibly ignored in this whole case. They also decided pretty early on in this investigation that they were going to use a computer system called Holmes to store all the information from this case. It's designed to hold a lot of information that can be accessed by any officer at any time, multiple officers at the same time, and it's laid out so that the most important leads are right on the front page as you open it. So the most important things in the case are right there for you to see. It's basically designed with cases like this in mind to make it easier to solve them, quicker to solve them. However, 
it kind of worked in the opposite way in this case. It turned out that less than half of the officers put onto the Stephen Lawrence case actually knew how to use the home system. And so the people that did know how to use the system were putting information onto it but obviously the other half of the people couldn't access that information. And the other half of the people that didn't know how to use it were trying to use it, trying to put information into it, but they were doing it wrong and so this information was getting lost because they were putting it in the wrong places and it was just getting missing in this big system. And so all in all, this system wasted a lot of time. It meant that a lot of information and leads and people's numbers and witness statements and things like that were just going missing and it just made the case so much harder than it needed to be. So anyway, back to the present time of them trying to solve the case. So police really just kind of assumed that Stephen was a gangster, he was a criminal, and that he probably knew his attackers and possibly expected that he was going to be attacked. They believed that Stephen probably provoked his attackers because he was part of a gang or because it was drug or crime related, despite witnesses telling police what they saw, telling police that they saw a group of white boys attacking this boy unprovoked just because of his race. And it's believed that police assumed a lot of these things, just assumed that Stephen and Dwayne were in a gang or just assumed that Stephen was a criminal because he was black. And that is what a lot of people assume. That is what Stephen's own family assume. That is what the majority of people that look into this case assume. That the police had some sort of racial bias and that was why they didn't care to look after Stephen as he was laid on the side of the road bleeding out. That is why this case was so slow in the beginning. That's why they didn't answer too many calls. That's why they just didn't care to put too much effort into this investigation because he was black and therefore they believed that he was a criminal and brought this on himself. Police spent a lot of time questioning Stephen's family, Stephen's friends, everyone in Stephen's life rather than actually trying to find his killers. They checked all of Stephen's family's kind of criminal records, even though that has literally nothing to do with Stephen's own murder. Police just wanted to find any kind of evidence to confirm their assumptions. They just wanted to believe anything other than the obvious true story that even witnesses were telling them. And police had 22 tip-offs about this one specific gang who had backgrounds of racially motivated crimes, knife crimes. How much more obvious could these suspects be? Yet police didn't care about that. But still, 10 days after Stephen's murder, no arrests had been made. Even though police could arrest these five boys on the grounds of reasonable suspicion, they just weren't, they didn't want to. It was at this point that Nelson Mandela was visiting the UK and he'd actually heard of Stephen's murder and wanted to meet with his parents. After the meeting with Doreen and Neville Lawrence, Mandela held a press conference where he said, from what I hear from the Lawrences, black lives are cheap in this country. And it took being shamed by one of the world's most powerful and respected activists for police to finally make arrests in this case. So the Air Court brothers and Gary Dobson were the first to be arrested and then David Norris actually turned himself into police and was arrested three days later and then Luke Knight was the last to be arrested almost a month after the first three. The questioning of these boys however was really kind of useless. All the boys said was no comment even to their own name. They would just say no comment to everything. In one of the boys questionings, I don't know which boy it was but one of the boys questionings actually only lasted for seven minutes and within that seven minutes that boy was actually only asked seven questions relating to Stephen Lawrence's murder. Police also searched the boys homes but with very kind of minimal effort. Police had actually had a tip off that the boys were hiding weapons underneath their floorboards however the police didn't inform the officers going to search the houses that they'd had that tip off. And so how were the officers actually searching the house supposed to know that they were supposed to look underneath the floorboards? They wouldn't think that. And they didn't think that. So if there were weapons under the floorboards, they completely missed it because they didn't check. And obviously because police had waited so long to actually arrest the boys, they'd had chance to get rid of any evidence. So clothing that might have forensics on it that have had chance to wash it or burn it weapons obviously they will have gotten rid of so 
how much evidence were they really going to find in these home searches? They did however see some clothing from each of the boys that matched kind of witness descriptions of what the attackers were wearing. They also got some witnesses to look at a police lineup with Neil Acott in it and several of them actually picked out Neil as one of the attackers. And one of these witnesses that actually picked Neil out of the lineup was Dwayne Brooks, and so police felt that that was good enough evidence, so they charged Neil Acott with murder. Then, over a month later, police charged a second boy, Luke Knight, with the murder of Stephen Lawrence as well. But then, just over a month after that, prosecution decided that they didn't have enough evidence and so they dropped the charges against the boys. So in August of that year, after the charges were dropped, police were forced to do an internal review of the police investigation of Stephen's murder. But somehow, in April of the following year, after the review was done and everything, the officer that carried out the review of his own team said that everything was done how it should have been. Obviously he's going to say that about his own team, otherwise he'd get into trouble. Why would he say anything else? But over a decade later, so way after this, I'm just skipping way ahead in the timeline, another review was done about the whole case once it was solved and it was found that everything was so corrupt in this police investigation. It found that that officer that carried out that review was wrong, he was lying just to protect his team, they found that so much went wrong in this first investigation and they were forced to do a public apology just years and years and years later. But anyway, back to the timeline. For a whole year after Stephen's murder, the case just went pretty much cold despite constant campaigning from Stephen's family. And after being pushed by Stephen's family's campaigning and public outrage that police still hadn't found these murderers, Police finally stepped up the investigation a little bit. They planted a hidden camera and recording device inside the flat that Gary Dobson was renting, hoping that maybe he'd have the whole gang round and maybe they'd talk about the murder. And when police listened to the tapes, they didn't hear anything about the murder, but they heard a lot of just vile, racist language. But like I said, the men never spoke about Stephen's murder because why would they? It was a whole year after his murder. If they had committed it, why would they still be talking about it a year later? If police were going to do this hidden camera thing, hidden recording device, they should have done it within the first few weeks of the murder when they were suspects not waited a full year because they wouldn't have been talking about it on the day to day. The only thing that police did get from these hidden recordings was the racist language which was a proof for a motive maybe but it wasn't substantial evidence enough to re-arrest them. It was just in case they ever were re-arrested for more substantial evidence this could also be used to back that up, that they were racist. And so at this point, Stephen's family were sick of being told that they didn't have enough evidence to prosecute the gang. So they pulled their case from the Crown Prosecution Service, which is the service that does all the prosecutions in the UK, and they decided to go private. Now this was gonna be very, very risky, just in case they didn't have enough evidence or the right evidence and maybe the gang were acquitted of Stephen's murder. Due to double jeopardy laws, if that did happen and if the gang were acquitted, that means that they can never be tried again for Stephen's murder. So it was like they had to get this right. This was their only chance. So in April of 1994, a year after Stephen's murder, Jamie Acock, Gary Dobson and David Norris all stood trial. So Stephen's family's biggest piece of evidence that they had against the boys was that Dwayne Brooks, a witness of the murder, had picked two of them out in police lineups. So now Dwayne had to withstand some form of kind of cross-examination in court to check that he was reliable in his evidence. However, he couldn't prove that. He was found to be unreliable and that evidence was thrown out. And mainly because of that, after just a week of trial, the prosecution just completely collapsed. And so Dobson, Knight and Jamie Acott were all acquitted of Stephen's murder. And so another police inquiry went on into Stephen Lawrence's murder and for three years as that was going on, everything just kind of went pretty quiet in the public about this case. The inquiry resulted in Stephen's death being branded as unlawful killing in a completely unprovoked racist attack by five white youths. And that was based on evidence and witness testimonies. And that was now official, even though we pretty much already knew that, 
that was now official. And after this verdict, the Daily Mail newspaper in the UK decided to make Stephen its front page story. And Stephen's case hadn't been in the headlines for coming up on four years at this point. And this headline that the Daily Mail made was one of the most kind of memorable parts of this whole case. The main headline on that front page was murderers in huge block capital letters with all five boys pictures, their names, their ages, everything on the front page. And as you can imagine, this was very risky of the Daily Mail to do because they were calling these men murderers when they weren't officially guilty of murder. So if they were ever found not guilty, they could sue the Daily Mail for calling them murderers in front of millions of people in the UK. And the Daily Mail knew that, so they wrote on that front page, the Mail accuses these men of killing. If we are wrong, let them sue us. And this really just shot Stephen's case straight back into the public eye. And because the Daily Mail was so confident that these were the killers, so was the rest of the public. And so everyone began campaigning again, but this time, 10 times harder. But still, police didn't really seem to be doing anything at all. It seemed as though they were doing nothing. They couldn't tell anyone what exactly they were doing to investigate this case. They were just saying, we're working on it. Then in 2004, the Crown Prosecution Service announced that there was insufficient evidence to prosecute anyone for Stephen's murder. And this was, as you can imagine, the absolute worst news that Stephen's family could have gotten. It means that no one is gonna pay for taking the life of their son. But then a year later in 2005, the law was changed and double jeopardy was allowed to be repealed in very serious crimes such as murder, rape, just very serious crimes where new evidence comes up. And so in June of 2006, police began re-examining this case to see if there was any new evidence that they could bring up so that they could repeal the double jeopardy because three of those boys were acquitted in 1994. And so to find this new evidence, they began re-examining a bunch of the evidence that they had before, but this time with better forensic technology. Because the first time that they tested like all the boys' clothes and things, it was in 1993 and now it was 2006. And so forensic technology will have been 10 times better they might have been able to find something that they couldn't find before. And they actually did. On the collar of Gary Dobson's jacket, they found a microscopic stain of blood. It's believed that at some point during the attack, possibly after the knife was drawn for a second time, so as it was coming out of Stephen's body, a tiny microscopic droplet of his blood will have become airborne. This tiny little drop of blood was less than half a millimetre in diameter and it actually splashed onto Gary Dobson's collar which was now tested in 2006 and found to be a match to Stephen Lawrence's blood. There was actually odds of a billion to one of it being anyone else's blood and so this was really promising evidence. They also found fibres on the jacket with a 99.9% .9 chance that they were from the polo shirt that Stephen Lawrence was wearing that night as well. And also on an item of David Norris's clothing, there were tiny little fibres of Stephen Lawrence's hair, proving that David Norris was also at the scene of the murder. So with this new promising forensic evidence, in May of 2011, Gary Dobson and David Norris, both now in their 30s, were both arrested and charged with the murder of Stephen Lawrence. Their trial began in November and lasted two months, when in January of 2012, both men were found guilty with the murder of Stephen Lawrence. Both men were given life sentences. Gary Dobson got a minimum of 15 years and David Norris got a minimum of 14 years. And the reason their minimum sentences were so low is because the men were actually sentenced as juveniles because they were only 16 and 17 when they actually committed the crime. Had they been sentenced as adults, because they were now in their 30s, had they been sentenced as adults, their minimum terms would have been more like 25 to 30 years rather than 14 and 15 years. In April of this year, Prime Minister Theresa May announced that as of next year in 2019, the UK will have what is known as Stephen Lawrence Day. Every year on April 22nd, the day that Stephen was killed, the UK will have Stephen Lawrence Day, which will be used to commemorate his death, but also to educate young people of racism and violence. But yeah, that completes this case. A very 
<laughs> a very frustrating one, honestly. This is genuinely the worst police work I have ever seen and this is deliberate as well. Well, I personally think it's deliberate. Whatever you think is, it's up to you, you know? Everyone's got opinions, everyone's entitled to their opinions, that's fine. But Stephen's family and the majority of people that know about this case believe that the police had some sort of racial bias when it came to looking after this case. And I just think the way that the police treated Stephen as he was laying there bleeding out on the floor, whether it was due to his race or not, that is completely unacceptable. For whatever reason they gave for not helping that boy, even just speaking to him or sitting with him, even if they didn't know first aid, they could have at least sat with him and held his hand like those Christians did. Thank God that they were there. I would hate to be Stephen's mum and to think that he died on the side of the road alone. I just think the way that police handled this in so many different ways is disgusting. From the time of his death all the way up until these boys were sentenced, the police barely did anything right and it's infuriating. It is really infuriating. But I'm gonna calm down now because <laughs> I have been researching this case for way over a week and I've just been an absolute ball of anger for the last week. Uh, but yeah, I quickly want to apologise now right at the end of the video. I was gonna do this right in the beginning but then people are, I don't know, people are like, you apologise too much and I'm like, yeah, because I got a lot to apologise for. But I'm sorry for not uploading in like way over a week at this point. I mean, I think I uploaded a makeup video the other day, but it's because I had a migraine, a really bad migraine. It was so bad. It lasted six days and it was awful and it was terrible and it was really bad and it hurt a lot. So I'm sorry there hasn't been a video in so long. That's my reasoning for it. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm also sorry for apologising again because people don't like it when I do that. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed, make sure you leave a thumbs up so that I know it really helps me out and subscribe down below if you want to see some more from me. And yeah, thank you so, so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye.